Hello, welcome. Hello, welcome to the next chapter of the one and only movie. This chapter is called The Cage. Again, there was much chattering from the humans. After a while, they pushed me down a small metal ramp to the ground. I was lying on my side. Carefully, they cut the ties on my front and rear legs. They made calming noises as I tried to stand. I was still a little woozy, so two of the humans helped me stand. I wobbled like I had the day I was born, but I was upright at least. I took one step, then another. Around me, the humans made soothing sounds and showed their teeth. Later, I would learn that's called smiling. Later, I would learn many important things. But where were the babies I'd smelled? And why were their scents happy and calm while I was trembling and terrified? When a bunch of humans herded me into a large wooden cage, I didn't resist much, though I did attempt a couple of lame charges to scare them off. It didn't work. They just showed me their teeth and kept pushing. The cage was made of pieces of wood, one stacked on another. It had a wide door and the ceiling was high, higher even than grandmama. Wood was everywhere. It was like being caught in a stand of trees without any leaves. There was hay underfoot, though clean and sweet smelling, and fresh water at last. I looked up to see a tall, thin human standing in the doorway. He was wearing loose coverings over his skin, like the other humans, and a silly round thing on top of his head. He smiled, and then he made the most wonderful noise, like water bubbling up from deep underground. That was the first time I heard Jabori laugh. Introductions. Uncle Ivan smiled. Ah, he said, Jabori, the friend you saw today. I nodded. Yep. Funny thing is, I should have been terrified. Grandmama's warning about humans was blaring in my head, but Jabori made it impossible to be afraid. I can't explain it. Maybe it was because he smelled like an elephant. The scent of other calves was on his clothes, his hands, his shoes. Maybe it was the way he constantly sang or hummed or talked in that soft, low, wind-in-the-trees voice. Maybe it was the way he knew what I needed before I knew what I needed. I've never met a human who understood elephants as well as Jabori, and I doubt I ever will. Sentinels. There's a word elephants have for those who take care of us. We call them sentinels. A sentinel is someone who looks out for you. It can be someone who's part of your herd, of course, but it could be anyone. Sentinels can be your caretakers or your friends or your teachers or your neighbors. They look out for you. They understand you. They help you. Sentinels make you feel safe. Jabori was my sentinel. My mama was a sentinel, of course, and my grandmama. My African herd was Jichinga too. The two bulls who'd saved my life, the humans flying in the giant insect, and the others who had helped, although it took me a while to realize that. I looked at Uncle Ivan and Uncle Bob. My eyes were hot with tears. You, I said, you are my sentinels. I sniffled a little. I'm a very lucky elephant. What Jabori knew. Jabori knew I always needed a blanket draped over my back at night. The blankets were thick and heavy, and my favorite one had dots that reminded me of mud spatters and long stripes that reminded me of elephant paths. Jabori knew I would be hungry right on schedule every three hours. Jabori knew just how to scratch an elephant ear. Jabori knew when I dreamed of awful things and thrashed and moaned that putting his arm around me and humming softly would help me find peace again. And Jabori knew that I needed a name, a new name for my new life. He called me Dooney and before long, Naya was just a fading memory like a morning star. I think maybe Jabori may have been cart elephant. First things first. 
He started with food. Jabori understood what mattered to a baby elephant. Right away, he brought me something in a dented bucket. I heard a sloshing sound, like water in a puddle. I sniffed the bucket with my trunk and took a step backward. Talking and humming as he worked, Jabori dipped his fingers into the bucket. He waved his hand near my trunk, then put his fingers to my mouth again and again. Fingers in bucket, fingers to trunk, fingers to mouth. Whatever it was, it was a little bit sweet and a little bit salty, and it made my mouth water and my trunk twitch. It wasn't my mama's milk, but I wasn't in a position to be picky. In minutes, I was gulping from that bucket. What a mess I made. Reth would have laughed at me, but I didn't care. It had been a long time since my tummy had been so happy. Bob smiles. There is nothing, he says, like a bite to eat when you're sure you'll never see food again. An improvement. After two days of the messy bucket, Jabori brought me something new. It was shaped like a small, clear log, and I could see liquid sloshing inside. Jabori held the log upside down, and a couple of drops plopped to the ground. I sniffed them and knew at once that it was the same almost mama's milk I'd been drinking from the bucket. Gently, Jabori held out the white log. I tested it with my trunk. It was smooth and cool. I touched the end. It was soft and movable, like hardening honey. I trusted Jabori, but this thing did not make any sense. Unless I thought of my mother, and all at once I understood. The bottle was much easier for me to drink from and far less messy. I felt Jabori's hand stro stroking my back as I ate hungrily. When I was done, I burped so loudly that Jabori laughed until his eyes watered. And now you can see what the log was. And we'll come back tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.